The National Desk, America's News, now. Happening right now, the search for hundreds tragically missing in Maui. We haven't made notifications, and I am not going to say how we found people when I haven't even told their families. Defending their decision to keep sirens on silent. It's insulting to think that people would be that clueless, that they wouldn't know that sirens blasting was because of the fire. Taking a knee. Persistence. Big time just being able to stay into the fight. The coach let go for praying on the field. Now he's back with his team ready for a new season. Plus, millions of felons barred from voting. The fact check team looks at the laws. Could they violate the U.S. Constitution? And adding officers. Why some cities are refunding the police but can't find enough people to wear the badge. Capital. This is the National Desk America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton. We are so glad you're with us on this weekend edition. We take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. The fourth criminal indictment against former President Donald Trump. How the charges are already impacting the 2024 race to the White House. Mixed signals on the economy. Consumer spending is trending up, but Americans are also taking on more debt. The fight over abortion takes a new turn. New developments in the legal battle over Mifepristone, plus the state suing Planned Parenthood. And two years since the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, how conditions in the country have changed for women and girls. Developing now security concerns as threats intensify surrounding the trials and upcoming court dates involving Former President Donald Trump, after his recent fourth indictment, Trump denied any wrongdoing and took to social media to rally supporters around the idea that he's the target of a political witch hunt. Authorities in Georgia, they are investigating online threats made against members of the grand jury that indicted Trump. Some of those jurors have had their photos, social media profiles, and even home addresses leaked on numerous websites, including on pro-Trump forums. Meantime, some conservatives are demanding the U.S. House of Representatives move forward with the impeachment of President Biden. The National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman answering two big questions. What is behind the movement and why it could backfire? For Donald Trump, it's been a difficult year to say the least. This week, suffering his fourth indictment, the threats to his 2024 hopes and his physical freedom piling up. We love you, Donald! Trump's super PAC going on the attack, trying to shift suspicion to the current president. Your brother, grandkids, even nieces and nephews got paid from foreign deals. Your family and their cronies raked in over 17 million from these schemes. The anti-Biden barrage pushed by organizations like the Conservative Action Project in this new letter, now calling on House Republicans to open an impeachment inquiry against Biden as soon as they come back from summer recess. The conservative campaigns having an impact. 65% of voters in a recent poll said they believe the Justice Department steered the investigation of Hunter Biden to protect him and the president, including 51% of Democrats. Where's the truth? You've got to get to the bottom of the truth. And the only way Congress can do that is go to impeachment inquiry that gives Republicans and Democrats the ability to get all the information. Calls for impeachment are becoming common in Washington and perhaps retaliatory for Trump's two impeachments, with Republicans threatening to do the same to the head of the FBI, Homeland Security, and Attorney General, and of course, President Biden, who for years has proclaimed his innocence. I've never discussed my business or their business, my sons or daughters, and I've never discussed them. If there is proof the president broke the law, the House Republican Committee investigating has yet to find it. And not all Republicans support impeachment. Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, among others, hesitant. Impeachment ought to be rare, he warned. This is not good for the country. Worried it could distract from their larger agendas and strategies to try and win in 2024. In Washington, Scott Thuman for The National Desk. Scott, thank you. Deja vu on Capitol Hill as talks are already underway to avoid a possible government shutdown on October 1st. 
The threat was narrowly voted in June after Democrats and Republicans reached a last minute debt ceiling deal. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he agrees with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy on using a continuing resolution to temporarily fund the government. However, he also noted Congress is still divided on a long-term spending agreement. Republican Representative Morgan Griffith doesn't support the idea of a stopgap bill lasting more than a few weeks. Higher gas prices, higher inflation across the board, everything costs more. People are angry out there on the street and they're very frustrated with what's happening here in Washington. McCarthy hasn't said how long he thinks a continuing resolution would be needed to prevent a shutdown. Schumer says he believes a funding extension should go through early December. Checking in on your money now. Mixed signals from the economy are making it difficult to predict holiday shopping trends this year. Yeah, some people already thinking about this. Retail research group CoreSight is hoping for a small rise from last holiday season's 5.3% sales bump. Researchers point to low unemployment and higher wages. And new numbers this week prove Americans are still spending, taking advantage of midsummer deals and promotions. The National Desk, Atra Al Nishar, reports. Americans' ability to shop once again, catching economists by surprise. Monthly retail sales in July rose 0.7% from June, equating to more than $696 billion in spending, according to census data out this week. A big driver of that? Amazon Prime Day. It definitely seems that e-commerce remains a real bright spot in a retail climate that overall is dominated by the, this theme of shifting away from goods and towards experiences. How are Americans able to keep up this kind of spending in the face of high inflation? The National Retail Federation credits steady job and wage growth. Another way they're able to do it? Turning to credit cards. According to the New York Fed, total U.S. credit card debt hit a new high of more than $1 trillion. Remember people used to talk about that $2 trillion of excess savings that stacked up during the pandemic? Most of that is gone at this point, especially at lower and middle income levels. We are starting to hear about people taking on more credit card debt and financing day-to-day -day essentials. As interest rates rise, keeping up with that debt is getting harder. The Fed data also shows the rates of credit card and auto loans newly transitioning to delinquency are now slightly above pre-pandemic levels. Target and Home Depot among retailers reporting earnings this week, expecting consumers to pull back their discretionary spending in the second half of the year. A new headwind tens of millions will soon face the resumption of student loan payments on October 1st. The White House watching closely as it marks one year since the Inflation Reduction Act was signed into law. It's part of a much broader vision for our country, growing the economy from the middle out and the bottom up. Perhaps a risky bet politically, the president banking on the hope Americans will start to feel better about the economy, shake off fears of a slowdown, and notice some relief in their pocketbooks. In Washington, I'm Atrel Najjar for the National Desk, America's News Now. Developing now, rescue crews in Hawaii are still searching for victims as the people of Maui begin to grapple with the fires that destroyed thousands of acres and took countless lives. The National Desk, Hannah Knoll, spoke to a survivor and crews headed to the island to help in any way they can. Lahaina is done. Lahaina will never be the Lahaina I've known it to be. New snapshots show a small fraction of the heartbreaking damage to the historical town of Lahaina. It looked like a war zone. Photos and videos taken from the ground hardly do justice when it comes to understanding the devastating impacts. Absolute destruction. Uh, beautiful, very tight-knit community that's now um, been reduced to ashes. 75 Washington personnel now deep in search and recovery efforts. An additional 30 members sent to Maui to try and find the hundreds of people unaccounted for. So our job, and, and we're going to be here until it's finished, is to search all these structures, search all these cars that were burned, be able to give that accountability, mark all the buildings that might have been damaged. Angel Badoa sent me these photos of what was once his neighborhood. Through tearful eyes, he shares moments from the terrifying night. The police officers drove through our neighborhood with the bullhorn saying we need to evacuate. And some people stayed or waited longer. Along with his home, he also lost his business, neighbors, and memories he will never get back. Our goal is to get in and out as fast as we can so we're not a burden on the locals and the local community. And that was Hannah Knowles reporting officials in Maui defending their decision not to activate the county's emergency sirens. 
The administrator of the Maui Emergency Management Agency believes it would have caused confusion. A professor at the University of Delaware who studies disaster preparedness says sirens can be helpful in cases of an emergency, but she stresses it, it really depends on how much time the public has to respond. Adding sirens can become less effective if there's a history of false alarms. The decision to not activate the siren system is still under review. The comprehensive review is going to be looking at that, both in this instance and then what we do going forward, because what we learn in this instance will, it will inform how we move forward and so how we can keep people safe in the future. Several survivors say they wish the sirens would have been used. Right now, the abortion pill Mifepristone can still be sold nationwide after the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld parts of a lower court decision limiting access to the widely used drug. The appeals court upheld restrictions on ordering the pill by mail and capping use through the seventh week of pregnancy. The Department of Justice will appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Meantime, the state of Texas is suing Planned Parenthood in a lawsuit that could bankrupt the organization in the state. The lawsuit claims Planned Parenthood received $10 million in Medicaid reimbursements that should have gone to the state. If Texas wins the case, Planned Parenthood could have to pay an estimated $1.8 billion in reimbursements, penalties and fees. Some cities across the nation that recently slashed police funding have decided to restore it in an effort to combat crime, but now they're struggling to recruit more officers. The Fact Check team has the very latest. There's a push right now for more police funding in cities that are experiencing high levels of crime. I'm today from the fact check team. Leaders are upping budgets for public safety, but there's still an issue with getting people to become police officers. What's driving this police shortage? Right. So, Eugene, I spoke with experts from the National Police Association. They say nine out of 10 police departments across the country are short staffed. Now, they say the defund the police movement is a big reason for the decline. But we also found the problem of recruitment has been building for 20 years. Yeah, many factors to consider. So what's being done to recruit officers? Right, so according to the Police Executive Research Forum, 38% of police agencies they surveyed are offering signing bonuses. Now, right here in Washington, D.C., the department is offering a $25,000 hiring bonus and $6,000 for rental assistance. Now, several states are also allowing non-citizens who are authorized to work in the U.S. to become police officers. Now, we're seeing this in places like Illinois and California. Critics of these types of policies say this could create long-term security risks. Okay, thank you. And for more on this fact check team topic, including links to Janae's sources, you want to scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. Ahead on the National Desk, America's news now. The U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan two years later. New details from a former Army leader about how they say the treatment of women in the country has deteriorated. This Tuesday marked two years since the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan following the chaotic U.S. withdrawal. On August 15, 2021, the Taliban seized the capital of Kabul as Afghanistan's U.S. backed president left. Since returning to power, the group has cracked down on rights for women and girls, including restricting their access to education, most jobs and public spaces. On the anniversary earlier this week, the National Desk Jan Jeffcoat sat down 
with retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Dan Davis, who served in Afghanistan. Since no country recognizes the Taliban rule, there's, there's very little engagement with them globally. So what does the country look like today? Where is it headed? Yeah, there's, there's a, a, in some ways a very stark difference from what it was when we were there. Uh, in other ways, it, it's kind of the same. And, and uh, the first thing right off the bat is that there's the levels of violence are dramatically down. And that stands to reason because, you know, there's no more combat. There's no more conflict between the Taliban and the, and the international community. There still is a little bit with uh, with ISIS. They have a, a, a band there that they uh, have some engagement, but it's pretty small and it doesn't seem to affect much of the population. Uh, but on the economic side, uh, it's it's near disaster. It's it's worse for everybody than it was uh, during the time when the United States was there, uh, and the people are struggling really uh, just for basic needs. Sixty something, sixty five, I believe, percent of the country is uh, in dire need of, of food aid. Also, we're seeing so many rights that have been stripped from women, from girls, ethnic, religious, and other uh, minorities. They've been hit the hardest in the Taliban rule. Tell us what's happening as a result of those rights being stripped from certain groups. Yeah, that, that's that's the most heartbreaking part. It was it was also the most expected and predictable in the in the initial days after the Taliban took over uh, in 2021. They they actually said they were going to moderate from their previous uh, rule uh, and they actually allowed women to continue working in several different areas. And uh, over time, that is, is slowly stripped out until uh, even within the recent month or so that some of the last provisions were uh, Im imposed a ban on them to where they have even less and, and the women were allowed in school for a, a good bit of time. But now then uh, up till the sixth grade, they are still allowed to go to school up to the sixth grade, but no longer beyond that. And, and of course, that's just a, a terrible situation that especially many of the, the women who were, you know, uh, such pioneers in Afghanistan mm -hmm. to try to rally for their rights have now you know, are very heartbroken. Does the Taliban face any significant opposition that could topple them? No, they really don't. They, they have what's effectively a theocratic dictatorship. Uh, I mean, that's just the truth of it. There is no, there is no opposition. Uh, it's illegal to have any kind of even disagreement with the Taliban. If they do, they they'll be jailed. So there, there are no political parties of any sort there. There is just the one man Taliban rule and their version of uh, the, the Sharia law from from the Islam. Yeah, and you know, Lieutenant Colonel, a lot of service members, especially those who served in Afghanistan, a lot of Americans, still furious with how we pulled out of that country. We lost 13 soldiers. What is morale like today in the military and what needs to be done to instill more honor and more trust with those who go into battle risking their own lives for Americans? Well, you know, Jim, right off the top of the bat is be honest. Uh, that was some, one of uh, remains among some of the biggest problem for military age males in the United States that, that uh, you know, want to serve. Uh, and, and was a big problem during the time of, that ta of the, the whole 20 year war, both in the civilian senior ranks and in the military senior ranks, where we were repeatedly told things were getting better, that uh, we're winning the war, that the Taliban is on the way down. And we know, I mean, we saw it graphically depicted two years ago that none of that was ever true as, as many people, you know, like some of the things I said over those years explodes that. Uh, but the people, the, the troops, we see that kind of thing, and they they just want people to be honest with them. And you see it reflected in, in our recruiting right now. It's in the toilet. It's just going down because the lack of trust, even among the American populations, based on recent polling, shows that there's a lower trust in in the senior military leaders. And part of that, a big part of that is they just don't believe what they're being told and that's what needs to change. So how, what do you see for the future then of our of our defense systems and our in our military? Well, look, there's going to have to be some changes. We, we can't maintain this. We can't continue to have these huge shortfalls across the board uh, in recruiting. So I, I you know I, I know that there have been and still remain some really good leaders and, and uh, you know we're going to have to see them rise higher and, and there's going to have to be some changes at the top and i think just pragmatically they're going to have to recognize that what they've been doing hasn't working and it's time to do the right thing across the board and just again be honest retired lieutenant colonel daniel davis it's always a pleasure talking to you sir thanks for joining us thanks, appreciate Jan. you and your service to our country by the way thank, thank you. you still ahead here going against doctor's orders the business facing legal action for alleged mistreatment of pregnant workers plus alarming new video of a brawl outside of 7-eleven the juveniles now speaking out, saying they were victims of a random attack.
The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America. We start in Nevada where two juveniles caught in a brawl at a Las Vegas 7-Eleven claim they were attacked. It's alarming video of full on brawl that forced 7 Eleven on Boulder Highway and Missouri to temporarily close to the public. Yeah, yeah. News 3 is still waiting for police reports from Metro, but we're hearing from two of four juveniles involved in the incident who say they were victims and the attack was random. They don't like, they grown, we don't go to school them, with them, we never seen them, they don't know us. Kay, the 14 year old, says they were leaving the 7 Eleven when one of the girls in their group was attacked from behind. They like grabbed her hair and just hit her. And that's when we all started, that's when they started jumping her. That's when we all started getting in the fight. She says store employees broke up the fight. The 14 year olds say they began walking home. And then that's when they got in the car and just hit the corner and just, just started driving fast all, and trying to hit us. The girls say they tried to hide behind a dumpster, but say the women rammed it with their car, trapping Kay. Two juvenile sisters were run over. And I see one, uh, both of them on the floor, but one of them looked dead. So that's when we was all screaming. And this investigation is still ongoing. However, the juveniles and their parents say they want justice. It was us teenagers plus like little ones too, like six, seven years old. So, and then them seeing that, that just wrong. Now over to Washington, the state is suing O'Reilly Auto Parts for allegedly discriminating and retaliating against pregnant employees. The lawsuit claims O'Reilly failed to uphold state required accommodations, causing mental, physical and financial suffering to the employees in question. Some workers claim they put their health at risk to keep their jobs. I was still required to perform tasks that were against my doctor's orders. Once my daughter was born, O'Reilly's continued to make it nearly impossible for me to get paid leave by not responding to the leave caseworker. In a statement, O'Reilly said it was, quote, surprised with both the characterization of the facts and the filing of the complaint and said its policies and practices comply with state laws. In Ohio, Cincinnati Bengals running back Joe Mixon was found not guilty of aggravated menacing. Now, Mixon was accused of pointing a gun at a woman and threatening her during a road rage incident in January. A statement from the Bengals reads, the organization is pleased that this matter is now behind everyone. And we look forward to an exciting season with Joe being an important part of the football team. Still ahead here, airfare drop. Ticket costing are seeing cuts as summer winds down. When to take that trip before price spikes return? You're going to like this. It's not too late for that vacation. Your money will get you more on a late summer getaway. Right now, airfare is already starting to get cheaper. Figures from travel site Hopper show the average domestic round trip is $257, down about 11% compared to last year. Experts say it's normal for prices to drop off late in the summer, but prices are expected to rise again after the season. And no more scrolling through dozens of product reviews on Amazon. The company is rolling out a new generative AI feature that summarizes product reviews. It'll pick common themes among individual reviews and put them in a short paragraph near the top of the product's page. It's already live for some products. Taking a look at the trending stories on our website right now in Brooklyn, library membership signups are soaring. 
thanks to new limited edition Jay-Z membership cards. The library says it has also seen a surge in visitors and a 10% increase in checked out items. In Fresno, police were shocked after receiving a call of a casket dumped alongside the road. Look at these images. They responded to the scene and thankfully no one was inside. The owners have since been identified and say the item is a Halloween decoration. Oh my goodness. In Georgia, researchers have identified an invasive insect that's a relative of the murder hornet. The bug doesn't pose a risk to humans, but it does target bees, which could affect some crops. Those stories and much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Ahead in our next half hour, changing courses. How your child's math curriculum could be shifting because of college admissions. Plus, city versus state. Why the governor of New York is at odds with the mayor of New York City over the response to asylum seekers. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. That's real creepy, isn't it? I believe most people would have that reaction. Crackdown calls. Lawmakers take aim at data brokers. What they say can help protect your personal information. And Inflation Nation, why one expert now says the economy could get worse before it gets better. Plus, charges dismissed. Why the closing of one case against Hunter Biden could open the door for more legal action. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Right now, Mayor Eric Adams and other city officials are asking the White House to help the city manage the large number of migrants in shelters. And there's lots of finger pointing happening over resources running low. The National Desk, Christine Frizzell, explains how cities and states are responding to some of the biggest challenges. Across the country, resources and patience are running low. But New Yorkers have been left to deal with this crisis almost entirely on our own. New York City Mayor Eric Adams revealing more than 100,000 migrants have come in the last year and with shelters full is reportedly considering setting up tents in Central Park and other green spaces, according to the Gothamist. Also blasting the Biden administration for the delay in issuing work permits to migrants. Other parts of the state, like Erie County, now pausing programs to welcome migrants after overcrowding and crime. Two serious violent crimes are alleged to have occurred in the past two weeks, and they are too, too many. Despite the issues adding up, Senator Kirsten Sinema accusing Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer of playing politics, sending federal money to his home state she believes should have been sent to her state of Arizona. That pressure, though, undeniable. Even as far north as Massachusetts, just the latest state to declare a state of emergency. Leaders making this surprising request to residents. If you have an extra room or suite in your home, 
please consider hosting a family. In the meantime, critics say the current strategy is one of reaction with no long-term plan. We should be taking the fundings to go and prevent the threat from actually entering our country rather than reacting to it after it's already here. We should take the money to secure the border. Now we are still awaiting the latest migrant encounter numbers for the month of July from U.S. Customs and Border Protection. May and June each saw a major decrease from the month before. The Biden administration crediting its new stricter policies on who can ask for asylum in the United States. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting for the National Desk. America's News Now. Christine, thank you. A series of government reports obtained by NPR are revealing shocking conditions experienced by people in ICE custody. Inspectors reportedly found unjustified use of force by staff and complaints of discrimination and harassment. Most immigration detention facilities are managed by private for-profit corporations contracted by the government. The investigation took place between 2017 and 2019. Right now, a new White House push to crack down on data brokers is gaining bipartisan support. The proposal would help safeguard Americans' data by extending regulations that already govern things like credit reports and arrest records. The rules would also prevent brokers from selling certain types of information, like a person's income or criminal history. The American people should know that Kochava geolocates where people go to church and then they sell that data to commercial enterprises, right? That's right. That's real creepy, isn't it? I believe most people would have that reaction, yeah. That was Congressman Matt Gates referencing a company accused of selling location details from mobile devices. Congress has failed to pass a nationwide consumer privacy law. A federal judge in Delaware has dismissed two misdemeanor tax charges against Hunter Biden at the request of special counsel David Weiss. Now, closing the book on that case enables Weiss to pursue new charges in California or Washington, D.C. The minor charges for failing to pay taxes on time in 2017 and 2018 were filed as part of the rejected plea deal. Going by the numbers now, a new poll from the Associated Press Newark Center for Public Affairs Research shows President Biden's approval numbers are still quite low, especially when it comes to the economy. Only 36 percent of U.S. adults approve of Biden's handling of the economy, while less than half approve of his overall performance. These numbers are similar to those seen earlier this summer, but remain much lower than when Biden initially took office. In January 2021, Biden's overall approval rating was 61 percent. This week, the National Desk Jan Jeffcoat went one-on-one with Vice President of the National Taxpayers Union, Brandon Arnold, to get a better sense of how these policies are impacting you. There is one key difference between what Biden did and what past presidents have done when dealing with awful economies, because his solution has been partisan, trillion-dollar spending packages. Tell us about the American Rescue Plan, the Inflation Reduction Act, which now the president even admits was, was never intended to reduce inflation. How do these all contribute to that, do you think? I think, first of all, you're absolutely right, Jan. Uh, We had some very partisan pieces of legislation that have been passed since this president took office. You know, just prior to that, when the pandemic initially struck, Congress and the president worked together in a bipartisan fashion to address the crisis, to start to help to support small businesses, families that were struggling. Biden took a very different tact. He passed this American Rescue Plan Act, $2 trillion at a very ill-advised time when inflation was already an issue absolutely supercharged the inflation problem that we continue to deal with. And then there's the Inflation Reduction Act. Even President Biden, as you noted last week, said he wish he hadn't named it that because if anything, in the short term, it's going to increase inflation. Maybe if he's right about placing this enormous trillion dollar bet on green energy, maybe years and years down the road, we'll begin to see lower energy costs. I'm a little skeptical, but what I know for sure is in the short term, if anything, we're gonna see higher inflation as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. Up until a few months ago, the rise of inflation had outpaced the rise of wages. What impact has this had on American families over the past two years? You know, I think, again, this speaks to the disconnect that Biden has with American voters because he keeps speaking about how strong the job market is. Labor markets are tight, as economists would say. That is to say, workers are in demand. Employers are having a tough time filling those roles. And the way they've been dealing with this is raising salaries, raising wages. That's a good thing. We like that. We want people to be paid more. The problem, of course, has been inflation has been increasing so fast 
it's been outpacing those wage gains. So even if people are getting slightly larger salaries or bigger paychecks, they're having to spend more when they go to the grocery store, more when they write that check to pay their rent, more at the gas station. So they're feeling poorer. That's a huge problem. That trend has just started to reverse, but it's going to take a long time before Americans feel that financial security that they had before the pandemic. I read something uh, from the American Heritage Foundation where Americans have essentially experienced a huge pay cut for the past two years. That's been equivalent to losing $7,000, which is a lot of money. And that's why credit card debt has skyrocketed. We're at historic highs, nearly a trillion dollars. So with the ongoing concerns of inflation and debt, and concerns of a, a deep global recession, what do you see right now as a solution? What's the way out? You know, I mean, first of all, that credit card debt issue, the it's auto crazy. loan issue, people are, that's why, you know, Biden's having a tough time connecting with voters because even if he's saying the economy is strong, when they're seeing those credit cards get maxed out, they don't feel very good about their own personal financial situations there. So, you know, Congress, the president, they all want to do more. I think that's the problem here. They always want to come up with that silver bullet to solve all of our problems. The truth is, a lot of times, and in this circumstance, I think they need to do less. They need to spend less money. They need to work to get our budget back in order, get our finances uh, uh, in, in order so we're balancing the budget or moving toward a balanced budget. Uh, again, they, they come up with all these fancy ideas of spending more money and in some instances even taxing us more to try to fix the problem. Uh, I'd like to see them do a little bit less and maybe be a little bit more interventionalist when it comes to our economy. You can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. New details, a Washington State high school football coach is back on the field following his win at the U.S. Supreme Court last year. Coach Joe Kennedy lost his job at Bremerton High School in 2015 for praying on the football field. He spent the last eight years in and out of multiple courtrooms, eventually making it to the U.S. Supreme Court, which ruled the school district had violated his First Amendment rights. Kennedy was reinstated and is now preparing for his team's first game on September 1st. This will be me stepping into a new arena with them, and the coaching staff's been so gracious. Um, school district is, they're, they're working through it, and hopefully we can move beyond this and hopefully have a great season. Kennedy said he still plans to take a knee after every game. We are more than 400 days away from the 2024 election, and some voters already know who they'll vote for. Meantime, millions of U.S. citizens won't get to vote at all. This week, the fact check team took a closer look at laws barring felons from the polls. Right now, 2% of Americans can't vote because of their felony convictions, but there's a push to change that. Connor is joining me now. She's not only part of our fact check team, she's also an attorney, so let's lean on that experience now, <laughs> sure. Connor. But please, in plain English, okay? Give yep. us the facts on that recent court decision on this issue. For sure, Eugene, I can do that. So simply put, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled Mississippi's law banning ex-cons from voting is unconstitutional because it's cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment. However, if this does make it all the way up to the Supreme Court, it's unlikely to survive because of precedent from 1974. I have it right there pulled up. It ruled that a state can take away a felon's right to vote. Now, that's the course. What about Congress? Is the issue being discussed there? Sure, it, ha it is and it has for some time. So there was a bill introduced earlier this year in the Senate and a House companion bill was just introduced last month called the Democracy Restoration Act. And it would give Americans who are out of prison and living in the community the right to vote in federal elections. However, it is Democrat led and I checked the co-sponsor list today and as of today, there's no Republican support for neither the House or Senate bills. So as of now, it's unlikely to pass yeah, into law. Sounds like it. Thanks for the clarity on this, yeah. Connor. And go a little deeper on this fact check team topic. You're going to find links to Connor's sources. When you scan that QR code you see on your screen, you can also visit us at thenationaldesk.com. So to come here, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from the first Republican presidential debate to the nationwide impact of the crisis at the border. Welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. 
The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. The first Republican presidential debate takes place Wednesday in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Our chief political correspondent, Scott Thuman, you're heading there. What are the big storylines heading into that event? Yeah, Steve, it's Trump. It's always going to be Trump for the foreseeable future, at least, as these other candidates determine, regardless of who attends, who doesn't, who's on stage, who's not. They have to find a way to make an impression. And that polling would indicate, obviously, so far, that Donald Trump has a huge lead over his Republican primary opponents. But debates do allow for breakout moments. So that's what they're going to try and do. Yes, there will be lines of attack on the leader. That's always the case. But in this instance, especially as the first debate, it's an opportunity for these candidates to really make an impression because remember, while we cover this every day, we talk about them, we know their names very well, many Americans for the first time will be seeing or learning who are Vivek Ramaswamy, who is Nikki Haley or Tim Scott or even Governor Ron DeSantis. So make an impression, but make it a positive one. Forrest, looking forward to your coverage. Uh, National Correspondent Christine Frizzell, one issue sure to come up at that debate, immigration. Cities and states far away from the U.S.-Mexico border are struggling to deal with an influx of migrants. Tell us about that. Yeah, one state certainly dealing with it in a major way has been New York, and in particular, New York City. We've seen Mayor Eric Adams speak about this just about on a weekly basis, that really trying to welcome people, say, you know, this is home. Uh, historically, migrants have come to New York. Many of us come from family members who have done that. Uh, but in the last few months, and especially in the last year, he says that they've served more than 100,000 migrants. Shelters are full. They have gotten some federal money to try to deal with this. He and, and a longtime ally, uh, the governor of the state, Kathy Hochul, are sort of bickering over uh, the best method uh, of how to deal with this. Even states as far north as Massachusetts just declared a state of emergency. The lieutenant governor there actually asked residents in the last couple of weeks, if you have an extra suite or room in your home, consider bringing in a migrant family. These are certainly unprecedented times. And then of course you have border states, states like Texas and Arizona. Uh, the independent Senator from Arizona, Kirsten Sinema, actually criticizing Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying he should not be sending money to New York. He should be sending it to Arizona and Texas, where the brunt of the problem is. Certainly we know though there is no sort of brunt of the problem. Uh, the challenges are just about every state in this entire country when it comes to immigration. And national correspondent Kayla Gaskins, one of the candidates on stage will be Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. I'm sure he'll be touting his quote, anti-woke credentials at the debate. Um, one big corporation though that you reported on is taking a hit recently after it waded into that quote, woke, woke politics. Tell us about that. Well, Steve, Target released their second quarter sales reports this week, and they were in the negative, down 5.4%. And it's the first time that their sales have been in the negative for a quarter in six years. And that's in part due to inflation, people tightening their wallets, spending a lot less on discretionary spending. But the CEO of Target coming out this week and saying it's also because they dipped their toes into the culture war earlier this year, back when they released their very controversial pride collection that featured things like tuck swimsuits and that really created a firestorm among conservatives, calls for boycotts, those boycotts, pretty effective. Now, this is the first time, this is notable, see, because this is the first time that a CEO of a big company has come out and said, yes, us entering the culture wars is why, at least in part, our sales were down for this quarter. And that's because when you look at sales for competitors, say TJ Maxx, for example, they have a lot of discretionary spending items there. They were up this quarter. Walmart also up this quarter. So Target was one of the few that saw a really big downturn. They've already done what they can to, to course correct here and believe that their sales will now be trending upwards. Steve. Washington Bureau Correspondents Kayla Gaskins, Christine Frizzow, Scott Thuman, thank you all for your great work and for your hard work. Back to you. Thank you all. And right now, a battle is brewing at one of the country's top university systems that could change the course of your child's math education at the high school level. The National Desk, Angela Brown, breaks it all down for us. The decision from the University of California system, controversial from the start, a policy change to increase the high school math course options for students as both college prep and equity issues. 
University of California expanding its list of courses that meet math requirement for college admission. Typically, that includes Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, now accepting other math-related courses like statistics. The Chronicle of Higher Education is reporting faculty members across the University of California system are staging a behind-the-scenes protest, saying the changes risk leaving students unprepared for college-level math. College Watchdog Group Campus Reform agrees. I think it's critical that colleges maintain the highest standards of academic integrity in order to make sure that the degrees are valuable. If students and parents are going to invest tens of thousands of dollars, we want to make sure that the students are going to become productive members of society. Ed Source is reporting that the UC Faculty Committee that oversees high school courses eligible for admission to the University of California has reversed itself and will disallow data science as a substitute for Algebra 2 as a course requirement. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Ahead here on the National Desk, America's News Now. The critical bus driver shortage impacting students nationwide. How one community is getting creative to keep the wheels turning. Plus, a surge in Americans visiting food banks. Why SNAP benefits backlog could be contributing to the spike. This is the National Desk America's News Now. We have reporters across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From food pantries in New Mexico seeing an increase in demand to a bus driver shortage in Maine, we're taking the pulse of America. But we begin in Columbus, Ohio, where a local plumbing company is making the loss of a job a little easier for one man. Are you still interested in getting the work done that we gave you an estimate for? Um, and I responded, you know, not at this time. I'm one of the yellow employees that 30,000 yellow employees that just lost their job. Unsure of where to go or what he was going to do, Scott Manasa wasn't prepared for the next text that came through. It said, uh, you know, my heart goes out to you. I'm, I'm really sorry that that happened to you. So who was on the other line? Austin Savan. He's worked for Eco Plumbers for close to five years. Life can suck, but you know, the, the sun shines again the next day. So it's one of my personal mantras to be a decent human being. It, it's not hard to be nice to somebody. That text chain traveled to management. Eco told me the job estimate was about 4,500 bucks. After finding out Manasa no longer had the means to pay for it, Eco showed up anyway and did the job for free. To have that um, human empathy, um, you know, towards my situation and yeah, it just felt really good. 
Food pantries in Las Cruces say that they are giving out food to more people than usual. They say one of the many factors playing into this is people not receiving SNAP benefits due to a backlog in paperwork. The Salvation Army Food Pantry tells me they've seen a 20% increase in the amount of people going to their food pantry every week. They add that food is not the only thing people are in need of right now. They desperately need help with either paying their utilities or paying their rent because they don't have the money to pay for it because they had to pay for groceries. Pantries say that while the number of people has increased, they're seeing a decrease in resources. Unfortunately, the food bank itself doesn't have enough food to send us to be able to put these boxes together. Another food pantry, Loaves and Fishes, tells me that it's not just the SNAP benefit delay contributing to the increase in the number of people going to their food pantry. I think that's contributing to the increase in just the price of groceries right now. The return of the school year is just around the corner for many Maine students. As young learners prepare to hit the books once again, multiple vacant bus driver positions within the Ellsworth School Department are leaving some concern for the new academic year. But there aren't enough drivers for the routes that we have. Department representatives say if the shortage isn't solved by the time the school year starts, drivers may have to make double runs both in the morning and in the afternoon, which could cause issues for staff, students, and parents. We want our students at school at, on time, and we want them to leave on time, and not having a full staff does affect that. The shortage has prompted other school staff to help out. I'm going to get my license so that I can help and be a sub driver. I have three other members of my custodial maintenance uh, staff that are willing to do it. School department representatives say that the issue isn't exclusive to Ellsworth. The other school departments are facing the same thing. To combat the issue, the Ellsworth School Department will pay for training and certification for new hires. Up next here on the National Desk, trigger trouble for Alec Baldwin. What a new analysis reveals about the gun he was holding on a movie set that shot the round that killed the film cinematographer. Developing right now, actor Alec Baldwin could again face charges in the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the set of the movie Rust. According to Variety, a forensic report found the revolver Baldwin was holding during a scene rehearsal would only fire if the trigger was pulled. Baldwin previously denied pulling the trigger, saying it fired on its own. Then voluntary manslaughter charges originally filed against Baldwin were dismissed in April. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, on Wednesday, the first Republican presidential primary debate is happening at 9 p.m. Eastern. Fox anchors Brett Baer and Martha McCallum will moderate the event. Then Friday at noon is the deadline for former President Donald Trump and his co-defendants to surrender to Fulton County authorities. The indictment alleges Trump and his allies plotted to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Also happening next week. The members of the United Auto Workers Union are set to vote to authorize a strike against Detroit automakers. Their current contracts with General Motors, Ford and Chrysler owner Stellantis expire September 14th. And that's going to do it for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. Check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on the nationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of the National Desk. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and from all of us here, have a great week.